welcome everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to, to welcome all of you to our webinar today, our Tuesday webinar at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. Before anything else, I want to introduce my co-moderator, the director of Dr. Class, and my friend, Steve Levitsky. Hi, everybody. Um, today, we are switching gears a bit from the format that those of you who've been joining us every week have seen in recent weeks. In recent weeks, we've had a series of panels about current issues that have featured several speakers. But one thing that we like to do in these webinar series is maintain our tradition at Dr. Class of having presentations on really important books um, when they're about to come out. And we are thrilled today that uh, to have one of those books being presented and we have the co-authors here with us to do that. Um, the subject of our um, talk today is, of our seminar today, is the volatility curse. And um, this is a really important topic for anyone who knows anything about Latin America to understand the longstanding uh, exposure of the region to, um, to the to, to volatility of prices of Latin America's commodities. But what, while there's been a lot of attention to the economic side, there's been less to the political side. There've been less to the political advantages and costs of the volatility curse. And that's what the, the book that Daniela Campello and Cesar Zucco are bringing to us today. Before I introduce them and our discussant, Bob Kaufman, um, I would like to give you a few housekeeping um, uh, notices. First of all, I would be remiss if I didn't thank our brilliant staff, Paul Ibarra, Jillian Scales, and Gabby Patterson, who have made this presentation possible for you. Secondly, we have Portuguese and Spanish interpretation today. Um, Ada will be doing our Spanish translation, and Robert and Enrique will be doing our Portuguese translation. If you would like to tune into the translation, go to the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and choose the language of your choice. Um, also, while we would love to hear from you, we've disabled the chat for you. Um, but we, you can submit questions at any time during the presentation. Um, through the question and answer function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Steve and I will be monitoring um, the question and answer, the questions that come in, and we will present them in rounds to our presenters. Um, and uh, so let me, without further ado, um, and also you will be able to, uh, Gabby has just dropped into the chat. You'll be able to view this, those of you who registered on our YouTube channel afterwards. And please do join our mailing list if you would like to see more of our great events. I would like to, I'm going to introduce the panelists um, and then I will hand it over to, to them. Um, the book presentation will be about 30 minutes and we'll have about five to 10 minutes from our discussant and then we'll open this up for questions. So the co-authors of this book are Daniela Campello and Cesar Zucco, as I said. Um, Dani will do the presenting of the book and Cesar will take the lead on answering questions. Um, Dani is um, an associate professor at the School of Business and Business Administration at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio. She was previously a professor in the Political Science Department at Princeton, and she was an associate fellow with the Princeton Program in Latin American Studies. Um, she worked as also as an associate professor for the Joint Program in Social Policy. Her research is focused on topics related to international and comparative political economics, and she's focused particularly on the political consequences of globalization. Um, notably, um, uh, neoliberalism, political ideology, inequality, and, and redistribution. Her um, first book was on the politics of market discipline in Latin America, globalization and democracy, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2015. It was a great book. I always assigned it in my seminar on inequality in Latin America. It got a great deal of well-deserved attention. And um, she's published in, uh, she's, she's writing another book now on the international economy, blind introspection and the limits of democratic accountability. She's been, uh, she's published in all the top journals, all the top handbooks in our discipline. 
and um, she actually had a prior life um, on the dark side as a fundraising manager, but it was with the Rio, the state of Rio's uh, a planning bureau, so it was all good. And her co-author, Cesar Zucco, is also a political scientist and associate professor at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio. Um, they are both, by the way, visiting scholars at the Wilson Center in Washington this year. Um, and that's where they're joining us from today. And Cesar was previously um, an assistant professor at Rutgers and held visiting appointments at Nuffield College at Oxford, um, Princeton, Yale, and Uberge, uh, or the former Uberge, I should say, um, in, in Rio. He specializes in Latin American politics, um, as Donnie does. And he's done executive, uh, he's done a very important work on political parties, voting behavior, and the politics of public policy. His, he did a co authored book with our friend David Samuels. Um, partisans, anti-partisans, and non-partisans, which is on my bookshelf in a place I can actually find because I pick it up and I refer to it often. It's a great book about partisanship in Brazil, which is a really hard topic to understand. Um, and he has um, co-authored The Volatility Curse, um, which we're going to hear about today. Um, and to bring when we when we were thinking about who could possibly be a discussant for this book, we all thought of the same person that those of us who organize this seminar and we had only one name in our list. And we were lucky enough that Bob Kaufman, our old longstanding friend and someone who we admire and who I've been reading since I was in graduate school, um, agreed to join us today. I think that's uh, a testament to the two of you as much as to us. Bob is a distinguished professor of political science at Rutgers, trained at Harvard, but we won't hold it against him. Um, he has a long history of association with Harvard, as well as Nuffield uh, at Oxford. He was, um, he did his time in, in creating public goods, um, treasurer of the APSA. That is actually, of the American Political Science Association, that's actually a big job. There are very few jobs in the, in the APSA hierarchy that are actually important, mostly it's the staff, but treasurer is a really important job. Um, but mainly Bob has written um, so many books co-authored many of them with our friend Steph Haggard, and they've all won so many awards that it would take me, it, it's like reading Meryl Streep's Academy Award nominations if I were to go through them all. The most recent one, I think, was um, the one about inequality, right? Uh, anyway, um, Political Economy, Democratic Transitions, Development, Democracy, and Welfare States, Dictators and Democrats, Elites, Masses, and Regime Change. And I'm sure there's one on political economy. I think I was handed an old file. But Bob, it is a, a pleasure to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to have you all with us today. And I will now hand the, will pass the palabra. I'm going to hand the microphone to, to Daniela at this point to start our presentation. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, Francis, Steve, for the invitation for the David Rapella Center. Thanks a lot, Bob, for coming here and discussing the book. This is such an honor for us to have you as a discussant and a pleasure as well. So it's always very nice to be here, and uh, it's a guarantee of good discussion. So I'm really excited to, to, to discuss the book with you guys. So let me share the screen, start by sharing the screen. Is it okay? Working? Okay. So the name of the book, as you know, is Volatility Curse. And uh, for those who haven't seen it yet, uh, here's an image of uh, the cover. And the cover, uh, we fought a lot for this cover uh, with Cambridge because it was an impression at first that this would look like a tourist book or book about traveling or fun <laughs> and not political science. But the reason is this roller coaster, uh, I think by the end of the presentation, is going to be very clear for everyone why we insisted on the roller coaster. Because it's actually about this roller coaster in economics, in politics, and how that affects representation uh, in Latin America. 
Okay, so I always start with this example of Carlos Andres Perez, which I think illustrates really well what we're talking about. Andres Perez was a president in Venezuela in the 70s, and as everybody knows, Venezuela is a country highly dependent on oil exports. Uh, oil exports were at their highest during this period. He was extremely successful and left uh, office with very high popularity. Turns out that in the 80s, uh, oil prices were on the floor, historic lows. Uh, the economy was doing really badly, and Carlos Andres Perez comes back with the promise of bringing back, back the good old times. Turns out the good old times never came, oil prices never recovered, and he didn't even finish uh, his term. So this is one illustration of how, uh, even uh, in, in the extreme case of Venezuela, in which everybody knows that it's a lot of the economy is about oil, and that oil price, everybody is relatively aware of the how high or low our uh, oil prices are. Still, uh, voters could not discount the good luck of Andres Pérez in the 70s or the, his bad luck in the 80s. And he was rewarded for the good oil prices that were not under his control, and he was punished by the low oil prices after a few decades. So this is an extreme story because Venezuela is highly dependent on oil, but we could put like Lula before and Lula probably his third term. Uh, we have Correa first, Correa second, Bachelet first, Bachelet second. Uh, Tabaré Vázquez, we have so many examples in Latin America of the same president under very different conditions and being uh, judged very differently uh, because of things that they do not control. Okay, so we, uh, we started this conversation uh, from economic voting theory, which we see as a very optimistic theory about democracy. In its simplest way, it just posits that the country's economic performance affects support for the incumbent. So in good times, the incumbents tend to be reelected. If they are very popular in bad times, the opposite happens, right? And why is it optimistic? Because by doing this very simple thing as voting with a pocket, in theory, citizens can hold incumbents accountable for their material uh, welfare. So they create incentives, good incentives for politicians to uh, try to improve and maximize this welfare. So there's economic voting should be a relatively simple tool of, uh, that would promote good representation. Of course, this is never simple, and there are lots of discussions in the literature about whether the vote is prospective or retrospective, if it's uh, social tropic or ego tropic, people care about their own pockets or about uh, economic aggregates, what's the aspect of economic performance that matters. But the frontier of this discussion right now, in my view, is that the, uh, the assignment of responsibility for economic outcomes. So who is actually responsible for uh, economic performance? There's a very interesting, interesting literature on clarity of responsibility that uh, um, examines what the, the institutional designs that promote more clarity or not of responsibility for the economy. But there's another strand of this literature where we plug in, which discusses how voters, how individuals uh, can assign responsibility, can uh, identify which part of economic performance that has to do with exogenous shocks not controlled by the incumbents, and which part is a result of policy making. So how, how far can people go in distinguishing what is luck and what is merit in this story? So in this end of the project here, uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, and we posit that world economic performance affects countries' economic performance, which then affects support for the incumbent. The question is, can voters recognize this? If they can, then they are still rewarding merit and they are creating all the good incentives that economic voting theory uh, predicts, right? So in Venezuela, if in Venezuela, voters in the 70s know that oil prices are very high and they discount this look when they judge the, the merit of Andres Pérez. And in the 80s, they know that oil prices are very low and then they discount this bad luck, then that's fine. And uh, in the, the, um, politicians are gonna be rewarded and, and judged by their uh, own merits, right? The problem is if when voters do not recognize this connection. And in this case, what voters are doing when they vote based on the economy is to reward incumbents luck and not merit. And this is what we argue breaks the linkage between uh, the performance of the incumbent and the rewards that he or she gets, and of course the, the incentives for uh, maximization of voter welfare, right? So the, the, the principle that we use here, and it's kind of a reference for us of what is what should be good representation. Good representation should involve politicians, leaders being judged by what they do. 
So the more they are judged by what they do, the better is the quality of representation. The more they are judged by things that they don't do, that they can't influence, then uh, the quality of representation falls. It gets harder and harder for people to select the best incumbents and to punish the bad ones. So this would be the accountability principle. The one example that I love to give is that of uh, oh God, is that of uh, uh, the board of an oil company in which uh, the board has to decide how much to um, how to devise the prof the the um, salary of or the the reward for the uh, CEO and uh, and when they do that they have to discount somehow the oil prices right if it's a board of an oil economy if we would create some form of uh, rewarding the CEO of an oil economy or of an oil company we need to discount somehow the oil prices otherwise uh, this CEO is going to be rewarded by luck and not by merit so that's the, the principle that uh, organizes this argument. One important thing to mention before we go to, to our story, this literature is a literature very based on Europe and the OECD in general. So it's a lit what we had when we started the project of this book was the recent book from at, at that time by um, Ray Dutch and Stevenson. And this book was about, uh, showed, argued that in Europe, voters can recognize what is luck and what is merit. And how do they do that? because they do that by benchmarking their economies. So voters in Europe, they know how economies are doing, they know they're doing better or worse, they know that they, are, they can compare their own country with other countries, and by comparing, they can infer the competence of um, the leaders. So in that sense, there are two things that the book argues happens in the OECD with respect to assignment of responsibility. The first one is by benchmarking, individuals can uh, identify, separate competence from luck. And the second is, in an economy that depends fully on exogenous conditions, and the example that they usually give is the Netherlands, a small open economy, voters should not make choices based on the economy because they know that uh, the economy is not determined by the, the incumbent. So these are two predictions that we are uh, testing and, and discussing in the book. So now question, uh, do citizens discount luck when casting an economic vote? That's the project. We want to know whether uh, individuals in Latin America can or not distinguish uh, luck from merit. And how do you do that? We first identify international factors, exogenous conditions, that international factors are exogenous to president, president's actions, and that affect the domestic economy. So factors that matter for the welfare of the people, but they are not under the control or the influence of incumbents. And second, we test the impact of these exogenous factors that shouldn't have any political impact, given that they are not under the, the control of incumbents, on likelihood of re-election, uh, popularity of presidents, and regular transitions of government. Why Latin America? There are many reasons besides the fact that we are <laughs> specialists in Latin America. The first one is that uh, we have a lot of variation in our independent variable, lots of exposure to shocks in Latin America. So this graph, briefly speaking, is a, it's a graph that pictures volatility of economic growth. So the lighter regions are regions which are very stable economically, and the darker regions are the most volatile regions. And we see that with the exception of, as you can see, Europe, North America, and, uh, uh, and Australia, most of the world is really volatile. Really, countries are extremely subject to exogenous conditions, especially emerging markets. Uh, so the, the whole theory of uh, economic voting as an instrument of accountability has been developed in a region in which there's a lot of stability of the economy. And the economy is not that dependent on exogenous conditions. So the rest of the world is very different. And I think it, this needs to be addressed somehow. So one reason to, to, to do this research in, in Latin America is the fact that Latin America is a highly volatile, volatile region. The second, region, the second reason is this is a graph on exposure to shocks on the x-axis. And in the y-axis is the effects of growth on elections. So what is the effect of one percentage growth average uh, on the likelihood that a president is re-elected or uh, elects uh, his successor or her president or party in the case of parliamentary systems. And the size of these little dots are the, the number of elections that we test uh, in this story. And what you can grasp from this figure is that even though exposure to shocks is way higher in Latin America, the size of economic voting is the same. So the first 
idea that individuals do not vote based on the economy when the economy is highly exposed to exogenous factors, that's simply not true. So in the case of Latin America, we are, the countries are highly exposed to exogenous shocks, and yet individuals vote with the economy most of the time. There's an important effect of the economy on uh, re-election. The third reason uh, we study uh, Latin America is the f actually, I'll keep the third reason here. The third reason is in Latin America, we know for a group of countries, which is South America, we know the exogenous conditions. There is a long literature, a long standing literature on which exogenous conditions affect the domestic economy of South American countries. So there's an advantage of looking into Latin America because we have two groups of countries, Central America and South America, in which the political systems are relatively comparable. They have a long uh, period of democracy, longer than other emerging economies, yet the models, the way that these countries are plugged into the world economy varies a lot. So this is that, there's this advantage of comparison uh, between the two, re the two regions, and at the same time, we know the factors that matter for South America. Okay, so which are the factors that matter for South America? The first one is commodity prices. So this is a graph of uh, the price of commodities, is the light uh, line, and the dark one is Latin American GDP. And it suggests as a figure, and we can we test it uh, effectively in the book, but it suggests that there is a very strong correlation between commodity prices and growth GDP in Latin America. And the reason is most of the countries in South America in particular are commodity producers, and when commodity prices go up, they, there is a, a, a gain in uh, relative prices in the world, the capacity to buy more uh, in the world markets. There is dollars entering from the trade uh, balance because there is a, a favorable balance when uh, the prices are high. At the same time, there's more investment. So many good things happen uh, when commodity prices are go up in the region. The relationship, so this is what we call the trade uh, channel. The financial channel is related to U.S. interest rates, international interest rates. And it's basically, as you can see, there's a, a, a downward down trend between uh, of interest rates since the 80s until 2010 that we study, and an increase in GDP. So it, that looks like an opposite, a, a, a negative relationship. And why does that happen? Because international financial capital tend to respond to uh, American interest rates. When they are low, financiers tend to put the money uh, in emerging markets, when interest rates go up, they tend to go back to safer havens. So in that sense, there is a negative relation between U.S. interest rates and money flowing into Latin American countries. So this would be the what we call the financial channel. Okay, so what, what is important to say is that countries are not dependent on commodity exports and on foreign uh, financial capital in the same way. Right? So what we do here in this graph is to calculate the, the share of commodities over total exports uh, on this axis, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, the, the debt service over exports, so exposure to foreign private capital. And what we find, what we can see here, is that there is this top um, corner in which countries are highly dependent on commodities and highly dependent on, on foreign uh, debt, and these are basically South American countries. And I'll leave it to the Q&A, uh, what's the major difference? But, but there, there are two different development models when we think about low savings commodity exporting countries of, Latin Amer of South America and the maquila-based, uh, low value-added um, manufacturing that is the basis of the development model of Central America. And then we can talk about Mexico, because Cesar has like this 15 minutes on my side, and I have to rush. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, the first step is to, to, to define these exogenous drivers of domestic economic performance. And what we do for that is that we create a, a, an indicator that is a summary of commodity export prices and of uh, US interest rates, and we call it the Good Economic Times Index. Uh, and what the, so it's a it's a unitless uh, indicator because it's just a summary of the variation of these two factors. But what we what we interpret this index as showing how favorable the international scenario is for the low savings commodity exporting countries of Latin America. So here we can see that I'll show you the longer term, but but here you can see like the the. Uh, the lost, the lost decade of the 80s, right? Very, very bad times. Some recovery in the 90s. 
Then interest rates in the U.S. go up again. There you have the Asian crisis, Russian crisis, Argentine crisis, all the crises. And then this very, um, this amazing period of a very extremely favorable scenario for Latin America. And then, then my, my first book actually <laughs> deals with that. And I think that uh, it helps understand, for example, the resurgence of the left in the region because it created rooms to maneuver for left-wing governments at that time. There was no IMF uh, trying to, to force conditionalities. There was a lot of money, fiscal resources. So this changed a lot of politics in the region, uh, not only economics. And what was a period for those that study that of lower income inequality, lower poverty, all the good things happened at the same time when the Good Economic Times Index was up there. What we show in the books is that the GATT is associated to high growth, that it's associated to lower inflation, lower unemployment, lower economic discomfort. So, as I said many times, good things happen when commodity prices are high and interest rates in the world are low. This is just very quickly, this is a regression of the GDP growth, inflation, unemployment on the GATT index. We find the expected uh, direction of the effect, positive with economic growth and negative to inflation and unemployment significant in all uh, all cases in central america that doesn't happen so there is no effect of the get on latin america central american mexican economies once established the good economic times index so these exogenous conditions that matter for um for domestic economies but they are not under the control of presence what we do is a very it's a very simple research design in that sense because we try to check whether these conditions predict presidential success in the region and other political conditions, actually. So this is just one illustration. We have the three decades here of the 80s, the 90s, and 2000s, the Good Economic Times Index, and this is re-election in Latin America. So we have low levels of re-election or election of the, of the successor that increased in the 90s and increased in the 2000s. The interesting thing about this is that when we separate into the low savings from all exporting countries of South America, and the comparison group, which is Mexico and Central America, we see that all the effect is here in the low savings commodity exporting countries. So it's not about Central America, it's about South America. And it suggests that voters are responding to these exogenous conditions. They tend to be happier with the governments when commodity prices are high, even though governments do not control these prices. Now we have the bad times. Like, so it, it makes it even more interesting to, to, to see this graph because there were bad times in the 80s improved Wonderful times in 2000s that reversed after 2011. And what we see is exactly the same movement going on in South America. So now the, share, the, the probability of re-election or election of the successor is definitely not the same as in the 2000s. Again, in Central America and Mexico, nothing uh, happens. So let me, I'll, I'll get to the three main results, uh, uh, empirical results we have uh, in the book. The first one is that uh, the Good Economic Times Index has an effect on the likelihood of re-election of uh, presidents in the region. So this, very briefly, is the effect of uh, 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 one standard deviation below the, the, the mean and above the mean on the chain, the probability of re-election of an incumbent. So we can interpret this as a going from bad times to good times, what happens with the probability of re-election. What we find is that the White dots are Central America and Mexico, the black dots are South America, and these are many models, different specifications. So what we find is that for Central America and Mexico, it doesn't matter where the gap is, the chances of re-election are not affected. In the case of South America, we have 45 percentage points higher chances of re-election going from bad times to good times controlled for the factors. So if we get like the opposite side, Lula, who was in the good times and now it's going to be in the bad times, his chances of success are much lower, right? Uh, and in Central America, no effect. There's another important uh, result that we find is that regular handovers of power, which are the opposite of irregular in the sense of resignations, impeachments, coups, uh, and all sorts of irregularities that happen when there is a transition of power in Latin America. Uh, the regular handovers are more likely to happen when the, good, the, the times are good, when the good economic times index is high. So here we are able to expand our uh, data set. We don't deal only with elections, but even we go back to, to the 60s. And the regular transition means it happens when it should happen according to the criteria that was 
predefined. And what we see is that the good economic times index was low here, increases. The highest share of regular transitions in Latin America happens in the 2000s. And now it's going down again. And yesterday we had this example of Chile be probably the next one to follow. So um, uh, that's the idea. So the, the, and here, just a, to give you a number, it's a 0.3 higher uh, chance of finishing term for a president when there is a one standard deviation in the GATT index. The third effect is the GATT affects popularity of the president. How much? Seven minutes ago. Okay. The GATT affects popularity of the president too. So this is a, 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 the average effect of eight countries in South America, of uh, the, the effect of one standard deviation in the GATT and the popularity of presidents. And as you can see, that stabilizes in about five percentage points higher popularity when you have an increase of one standard deviation of the GATT. The effect in Brazil with some controls for political crisis gets even higher, like to the 15 uh, percentage point level, but it's like close to, to the average of the region. So from bad to good times, increase in five percentage points in popularity. So one illustration of the story, now I'm really hurry up. <laughs> so this is Lula, uh, lucky Lula, commodity super cycle, low American interest rates in 2004, second year of his first term, he had 45 percentage points approval. After the increase in the GATT index from 2004 to 6, he goes to 55, 54.5. Comparing his unlucky Dilma, extremely unlucky Dilma, that got the inflection point of the, the Good Economic Times Index. She experienced the, the end of the crisis in the OECD, contagion, end of the commodity super cycle. In the second year of her uh, first term, she had 62 percentage points approval. After get the, the downturn in the Good Economic Times Index, it got to 41%. And now here's the, the interesting counterfactual. If Lula had experienced exactly the same trajectory of the GATT that Dilma experienced, he would have had 23% percentage, percentage, uh, uh, popularity, percent popularity. If Dilma had experienced not the downturn, but the, the, the bonanza that Lula had experienced in his first two years, she would have had 80%, 80 percent of popularity and not 62. So this is for you to grab, grasp the, 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 the effect of this variation. So this is just a wrap up. The last uh, story that I want to get your attention to because it has to do with the reality of Latin America right now. After this amazing commodity super cycle, we are now in this period of very, very sharp decline, and now we are kind of walking to the, the sides and not improving or getting worse, but a huge decline after a very good um, period in the 2000s. This is the third moment in our recent history, history that we have a sharp decline after uh, a very good positive uh, period. The first one was in the mid-60s. And the second one was in the beginning of the 80s. And as you remember, in the mid 60s was a period in which countries were turning from democracies to authoritarian regimes, military regimes. And in the 80s, there was a reverse of this. So the story is not that the Good Economic Times Index affects specific regimes, but the fact is that when you are in, the, in such a positive moment of uh, bonanza, people have these expectations that things are going to remain this way. So lots of problems that Latin America has, high inequality, poverty, violence, lots of these things are mitigated when times are good. And when times go back to what they are or they, they worsen very much, all these problems come back to the surface. So I have a problem, for example, thinking about like when we talk about Chile, Chile is an unequal country and that's why there is this big problem going on right now in tension. Chile has always been an unequal country and inequality was reduced in Chile after the booming times. So it's really hard to claim that, that this is exactly the causality. What I, but my my uh, understanding of what goes on in general in the regions that, that in the 2019 was the, the year in which there were so many crises in Ecuador and Chile and Peru and uh, in Argentina. And I think that has related to the fact that people are happy in good times and they feel the decline. And the decline is very frustrating. And we have like the, the, the economist cover of the Christ Redeemer going up and going down. And this is the expectation that people have. When, you, when the Christ Redeemer is going up, everybody thinks that life is solved and that the country is going to take off. And then suddenly they are back to where they were before the boom. And this is extremely frustrating and has political consequences. So conclusions. Uh, international economic factors explain key political outcomes uh, in the region, which is uh, it's evidence from the book, and we are talking about popularity, elections, 
turnovers, uh, what else? Voters do not distinguish merit from luck in countries where luck matters a lot. If luck didn't matter that much, if we were not that exposed to exhaustion conditions, this wouldn't be a problem. The problem is to be highly exposed to these conditions and still uh, people do not recognize the consequences of this exposure. Third point is, and this I'll lead to the Q&A, what is the story here? What's the, why are these things happening this way? Why we are departing in the book from this fully rational voter that makes calculations and updates in a Bayesian way what happens in the world to this effective voter that responds to life being better or being worse. So this was a transition that we made in the book and I think was one of the most interesting experiences in, uh, in writing it. The implications of that, politicians judged by luck are not subject to incentives anticipating in economic voting theories and we have a whole chapter to show that this is predictable that people don't know that they are in the middle of a boom or a crisis, but the politicians do know. And that has an effect on accountability. And then uh, we are right now, there's two ways, basically work in progress still related to the book. The first one is that Cesar is more focused on that, on culture cyclical fiscal policies. And I'll, I can tell you the story of, of Chile. That's a very interesting one on how these policies matter for leveling the playing field and allowing people to compare different governments. And uh, another project, which is to look into the long-term effect of the Good Economic Times Index in the sense that in good times, politicians change the constitution with the support of the people to remain in office because everybody's happy. In bad times, the opposition tries to, <laughs> to remove uh, incumbents with the support of the population because times are bad. And in both cases, this is really bad for um, institutional building. So this may be the volatility of the economy that's associated to the volatility of politics, maybe associated to institutional weakness in, uh, in Latin America. And I think this is an interesting implication to discuss of the book. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm done. Now it's Bob. Tell us, Bob. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and it's really outrageous that we ask people to summarize a book in about 28 minutes. And you did it beautifully. Bob, please. Am I, you can hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about this book. Uh, um, I hadn't anticipated saying this, but, but um, Fran mentioned that um, many years ago, I was the treasurer of the American Political Science Association. And um, my experience in that, I think, in that office, I think was quite, um, opposite to the uh, appropriate to the book uh, and the topic. Um, uh, during the time I was treasurer, the uh, endowment of the American Political Science Association plummeted. Um, and that was because the stock market during that period also uh, dropped uh, significantly. So um, I think this is another example of exogenous conditions. Um, uh, affecting uh, performance. Uh, anyway, you know, the, this is a really impressive book. Um, impressive in terms of its theoretical importance and also in terms of its uh, empirical foundations. And I thought the presentation that Danny did was excellent, uh, but I would also observe that it necessarily was partial and that uh, in addition to the kind of emphasis on aggregate uh, performance. The book also, uh, in, uh, in elections, the book also has data on presidential uh, popularity and has data on individual motivations, experimental data. And all of this builds, so there's a lot in this book, and a lot of it, uh, it builds on uh, years and years of prior research, Danny uh, and uh, Cesar, and obviously the um, personal knowledge of Brazil and of the region as a whole. So what I thought I would do um, is um, make two or three points, four points that um, occurred to me as I read through the book. Um, not all of them actually are weaknesses or critiques of the book, but just thoughts that, that came to mind, uh, particularly about the, the, the main claim of the book which is the relationship between economic volatility, and, um, the misattribution of credit and blame, uh, and uh, the, uh, the 
result of that being the undermining of, uh, of uh, democratic uh, uh, accountability. So uh, let me just tick these points off quickly uh, so that we'll have time for discussion. In the first place, this is not uh, a, a criticism of the book, but I, I'm not sure that the distinction they make between economic accountability in the developed countries and, uh, and the more volatile Latin American economies uh, is holding up, at least not in uh, recent decades. I mean, voting in the United States um, has become increasingly tribal, and this may also be uh, happening in other countries too. And uh, the more that voting is motivated by tri tribal identities, well, the weaker the Account accountability mechanisms are of economic voting, uh, since voters are more likely to interpret the um, uh, economic performance through the effective lenses that incorporate cultural and ethnic, as well as economic divisions. So, um, uh, uh, one hypothesis that comes out of the book is that the Accountability of uh, in developed countries has also been undermined, uh, although by different uh, causal mechanisms uh, that, uh, that are identified in the book. A second point, which I think is more relevant to the book, is that the analysis of economic voting uh, rests on the median voter concept. And so, if the economy is doing well, uh, the median voter chooses to reelect the incumbent. There's a good deal of evidence for that, of course, but I think that uh, the, the, the assumption also warrants a closer look. Uh, economic performance uh, is not simply aggregate, it generates winners and losers, and uh, voters might weigh the distributive policy of a government as heavily, or in some cases, even more heavily than the overall uh, economic uh, performance. So. Uh, the jury is out, it seems to me, on immediate voter theory and its relevance to, uh, to voting, but it's a possibility that, you know, distributive preferences are also uh, weigh uh, more heavily in the balance that, um, than uh, is implied in the book. I mean, certainly the uh, dislocations of neoliberal reform, subsequent uh, very popular distributive policies undertaken during commodity boom uh, by left governments are also factors to, um, to take into account and are closer to the kind of accountability uh, uh, than um, is implied simply by the aggregate performance. Uh, a third issue uh, that I think really does warrant some discussion is that I, I'm still confused a bit about how the behavioral micro level analysis that Danny and Cesar uh, report in their book aligns with the macro claims um, uh, that they make. I mean, in the experiments, they find uh, that uh, voter decisions turn on affect, something I mentioned earlier, uh, rather than on the evaluation of economic uh, performance. But as I read this, I thought, well, this seems to cut against the idea uh, that external shocks to the economy are are always decisive. I mean, if you have high affect for one side, you're more likely to shift the blame uh, for bad uh, economic conditions to the other side. Uh, and I, I'm not quite sure how all of this lines up uh, with the, uh, the explanation of the effects of, of volatility. And finally, I'd like to see some more comment on the weakness of, of the incentives of incumbents to align their interests with the electorate. I mean, this is a crucial point, uh, uh, but um, it maybe deserves more uh, attention than it was given. I mean, the, the, the passing reference to Lucky Lula and uh, Unlucky Dilma, uh, that needs a lot of unpacking, it seems to me. I mean, after all, in 2003, uh, Lula steered the economy away from a severe economic shock uh, with quite cautious economic uh, policies. And uh, unlucky Dilma did face a much worse uh, international environment, but she instituted fiscal policies that uh, I think significantly compounded that 
So the distinction between merit and law um, uh, maybe deserves again some more uh, some closer scrutiny. And then finally, finally, uh, let me make a quick comment on the book. Your, your suggestion of anti-cyclical fiscal laws might be a way to increase accountability. Accountability that might be true. Uh, again, I think they, as they say, the jury is out. Uh, but the Chilean case is a little peculiar uh, because uh, although they show that the impact of the Good Economics Times Index on a presidential uh, policy sort of overemphasized presidential policy in good times and then it turned to negative uh, results after the implementation of the fiscal laws, I, I don't think this argument, this finding fully supports the argument. Uh, since one after the fiscal laws, one might have expected the impact of uh, the gap to be neutral uh, rather than negative. Uh, so I think there's still a ways to go in figuring out how to um, how to resolve the the problems of the, of the volatility curse. So thank you very much. Uh, again, I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to uh, comment on the book. I loved reading the book. Thank you so much, Bob. So, so do, do you start it and I'll... Okay, do that. Go ahead. I think that Cesar is going to answer the questions, right? Okay. Um, I think, Cesar, that we should give you, or both of you, a chance, if you'd like, to respond to Bob's comments before we open it up for broader questions and before I impose my questions on you as well. Okay, thank you, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Thanks, uh, uh, Danish, for, for doing the hard work, and Bob for, for chipping in here. It's, some uh, uh, thoughtful critiques, which I will try to uh, address, or at least wave my hand at, at, a, at a few of these, okay? Um, so the distinction between rich and poor countries, uh, uh, or the way in which voters uh, uh, are, are behaving in rich and poor countries, or, or the developing world in the OECD might be overblown on our part. And this is an interesting story, because we presented this book a lot in Europe, and um, even Europeans would say, you know what, I think our voters are more or less like your voters. And our, our conclusion was that, yeah, you know, voters, perhaps they are more or less the same, except that the conditions are so much more favorable for voters in, uh, in, in less volatile places, right? So uh, if you have the same type of behavior in both places, you still might provide relatively better incentives to politicians if you vote with the economy in Germany than if you vote with the economy in Brazil, simply because the German economy it's less subject to exhaustion shocks than the Brazilian one is. So if voters are doing that, uh, maybe maybe the voters are the same, except that the, when the voters interact with the conditions, the what's uh, the consequences are tend to be more uh, uh, favorable in one scenario than another. And I'm going to get to the incentives, which was the other issue uh, that Bob raised in a second. Now the other the other point that Bob made on this on this issue of uh, of, of behavior of voters is the one of effective uh, uh, polarization and, and voters not voting with the economy. And I think that's a big question mark in the sense that uh, uh, we, uh, we we are coming from a world where we're looking at you know, 30 years of data and we see this very strong relationship between the economy and how voters vote on aggregates, granted it's aggregate, but we see some evidence on, on, the, on the individual level as well. And you know, there's always the possibility that between we're working with the book and, and the world, the world has moved on and has changed, right? So it, that is one possibility that uh, voters are, are less interested in the economy and even the, the way they perceive the economy might be clouded by their prior judgments uh, uh, that are, have nothing to do with the economy, uh, that are uh, on, on, on other aspects. That is a possibility. Uh, that said, I don't think it contradicts our finding on that fact because our finding on that fact comes, is driven, and at least that's how we think about it, on the effect, have, the effect of judgments, you become attached to a certain uh, president because you experienced really good or really bad times with him, not because of uh, necessarily what we experience in the US with a more like an entertainment type of attachment, right? So we have this, we, we, what we're calling effects, this positive judgment made quickly, not thoughtfully, based on some feeling, some, some ha having felt good. And what we're pretty sure about, and I think that's one point that might get lost in the presentation, lost in the book, is that the sheer size of the swings that you experience in Latin America and most of the developing world is the same. It's just so much bigger than any kind of economic swing that you can experience in the US or OECD in general, with the possible exception of the 2008 uh, slump that was pretty bad in the, in, in the rich world in some places in Europe. 
But on, if you look over time, the, the, the size of economic volatility, the magnitude of economic volatility is way larger in all developing world than it is in the developed world. Therefore, what we pose it here is that this huge swings generates huge effective ties. If you go live through a, a, through a slump of this, like a very, a very terrible bust, you're likely to have a very bad impression of that government that's going to carry on. If you live through a very positive uh, boom, you're going to carry a very positive impression of that government. And that's that impression, that effective judgment is hard to overturn later. Again, why do you fix this point? Why do you create the judgment at one point and then uh, uh, do not reverse it later with another shock? I think that's, a, you know, that's still a little bit of a black box. And we imagine it has like a cohort effect when you come of age or when you experience uh, uh, firsthand as an adult or as a, as a, as a, as a thinking person, uh, when you uh, when you experience these shocks, you're going to create this effective judgment. But once it's created, it's sticky. And once it's uh, okay. once it's sticky, it's hard to uh, undo. Uh, so, I, so I don't think there is a contradiction between the effective individual level uh, result that we have and the economic result that we have. What we have is the economic result has huge, you get huge swings. And these swings need voters to not uh, 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 evaluate uh, uh, evidence that would say, you know, maybe the president wasn't at fault, or maybe the president wasn't as good as you think he was, because you already have this attachment. So yeah. that, that, that's the story. Probably we need to fill in the blanks a little bit more uh, uh, as we progress. Now, regarding this, um, the, the, the Lula versus Dilma comparison, um, I think that's, a, that's an interesting one, because uh, Lula, we can say yes, Lula did govern through the uh, uh, Great Recession, but he governed through the Great Recession in Brazil, right? And, and, and commodity prices were high, and the Great Recession basically hit mostly the developed world. And the main reaction was to lower interest rates, right? So that's one of the things that rich countries did. So in effect, it was not a crisis. You know, it was a, it was a tiny crisis. Lula was right when he called it a marola, but it wasn't a marola, but a little wave due to his own merits, it was a little wave because in most of Latin America, and almost all of Latin America, you did not feel it as bad because commodity prices were high. The response of the developed world was to lower interest rates for even further to start lows. And you know, China was still buying commodities most of the time. So it, everybody's reaction, not only Lula's, but any, anybody else in Latin America, most everybody did more or less fine in 2008. The problem was 2011, right? So and that was not necessarily uh, um, the, the uh, it was basically carrying on the PAL policy from 2008 and not reversing them, but nobody expected the reversal to be needed, right? You had been doing the same thing for 10 years. It was more or less, it looked like it was going to be fine. People thought it was going to be fine, we, and it turned out it wasn't. Uh, uh, policy should have been reverted, reversed earlier. Brazil had a bad luck to be in a pre-electoral year Nobody would, people, uh, government thought it would be, would be able to uh, um, push, you know, kick the, 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 uh, the can down the road and solve it later. And it turned out that it was not possible, right? But that was because I think there was a failure to appreciate the fact that the conditions then had changed in 2011. Then it was no longer uh, uh, possible to do what you, had been, what you had done in 2008. So yes, you might say, of course, you know, Lula would have done the right thing, Dilma wouldn't, it's a possibility. But the sheer fact that we're debating this suggests that if it's hard for us to determine to what extent Lula was good or lucky and Dilma was unlucky or bad, and we can kind of go on debating about this, it's almost impossible for voters. And I think that's the point. Uh, eventually, if we discuss it on and on and on and get all the details, we might arrive at the conclusion, say, oh, maybe it was 40% luck and you know 60% incompetence or something like that. But what, why, how would a voter do that? And I think that's that impossible thing. And so to consider that, that voters would be able to do that is, seems like an extremely tall order. And if they don't do that, we get to the point that uh, Bob asked us to elaborate on, which was uh, uh, um, which, we, which that he didn't have time in the presentation and I won't have time here. But the basic idea is that if, if uh, a president uh, um, is governing through extremely good times, think Chavez 2006, 2007, he or she could be do whatever because uh, they're gonna get reelected. If they're governing through really bad times, and then you maybe think at Afonsini in 88 or something like that, you know, you, cannot, you could do whatever, but it doesn't matter. You're not gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna get reelected either. So for these 
extreme situations, which are not that extreme, right? Because if get uh, fluctuates, uh, not that rare, right? Because if get fluctuates as much as we show, uh, uh, you get a third of the time in really good times and a third of the time in really bad times. In those times, governments have very little influence on their own re-election. Either you're going to win, you're going to lose, and it, that's it. Uh, you only have an incentive to try in the, when you're close to, when you have some uncertainty. And our point is that because of extreme volatility, the range in which you have uncertainty is rare or relatively rare, not all the time. Uh, so if economic voting or the elections were to actually try to discipline or incentivize positively the governments, they, we, our intuition here is that they would only produce this positive incentive biasing when there's some uncertainty about the election results, which is about you know, a third of the time. The rest of the time, it's a done deal, and it's a done deal because of something presidents cannot control, even though they can know, they can anticipate, but they cannot really control. So that's that's a little bit the story of this last chapter, which we which we you know talk a lot, but we don't show them. We just tell show a, a few stories. So that's why we think there's a problem here that needs to be solved. Um, if the, if that is doesn't exist, if there's not that problem, then it's just like a curiosity about Latin America. But if that if you agree, or if we can agree that that uh, uh, presidents not responding to electoral pressures is a problem for the democracy, then we have to figure out well, what can we do, right? And then I agree with you, Bob, uh, we, we'll be talking about this uh, uh, possibility of contracyclical fiscal policies, but it is right, uh, these, even if they do work, they're very technically complicated, even if they were to produce the kind of a leveling effect of, of, of political luck, uh, they are, there's a political problem, how, why would a president implement such a thing, right? If you're in governing for a really good time, why would you tie your hands? There's a lot of distributive pressure in Latin America. There's a lot of poor people. There's a lot of people who are underserved. If you're governing and you have funds, how, why would they save it for the next guy? I, mean, I wouldn't. Uh, and if you don't have the resources to do to, what, how would you create a credible counter-cyclical fiscal policy when you're starting from a bad position? It's also hard to do. So the policy, even if the economics, which is our uncertain where to work, uh, Getting these things, this type of policy into place seems like, you know, almost like a random thing. It's really weird that, that Chile did it. Uh, I had never seen a convincing story beyond, you know, the people involved really wanted it. Uh, and, 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 you know, that makes it difficult for us to, to, to make it uh, as a prescription. But that doesn't wipe the problem away, right? Because we don't have a solution doesn't mean we don't have a problem that needs to be addressed. And I think we just need to think harder about it to be able to come up with a, a slightly better solution. So I kind of waved my hand to some of these things. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the aggregate versus the uh, um, individual uh, impression of the uh, elections. And, and you're right, right? And so may, uh, we look, we look at, in the first part of the book, we look, we look a lot at aggregates. So it's like a, a average vote share or, or, or chance of re-election based on the economy. And you're right that there's a lot of the, uh, the, the, the economic performance hits individuals differently. There's distributive variation on how individuals feel the economy. Uh, we do think, however, that the size of the magnitude, again, the magnitude of these volatility, uh, of these swings, trumps a little bit of that. So I think the distributive pressures make a lot of sense in the OECD that, you know, that's where the literature went, great unpacking how different groups respond to the economy, how they're hit differently. Now, if you go through a boom or through a bust in Latin American style, everybody feels it. Or, a large chunk of the electric fields. Right? So the fact that you're doing a little bit better, a little bit worse, uh, um, is probably less relevant given the sheer magnitude of the swing. And, and I, I think here's where that he was mentioned, like, you know, all the literature on economic voting comes from OECD mostly. And this is a problem that doesn't exist in the OECD because the size of the volatility, of the volatility swing, the swings, the size of the economic swings are not, is not that big. And there's a, it makes it qualitatively different when you have uh, uh, swings as large as you do experience in the developing world. That's, that's, we think that's, that's part of the story. Um, so yeah, uh, there's more room for this redistribution and policies in good times. In bad times, there's very little that can be done. And that kind of shows in the data, but we don't have the data as good as we needed to show that. But there seems to be some more departure of performance under good times and under bad times. When, when, when exogenous conditions are bad, everybody goes badly in terms of politics. When the exogenous conditions are good, there seems to be more room for policies, uh, you know, to be more uh, electorally beneficial or less electorally beneficial and probably more distributive or less redistributive policies are possible under good times. Uh, uh, under bad times, nothing's possible. So we think that the size of the swings kind of trumps 
the differential impact that they might have, that the economy might have in different ways. But that would be my life. No, I have just one one addition, uh, Bob. I think that we we again, as we saw in two thousand and nineteen, Chile was not uh, free from all the, the 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 confusion, the political mess that all the region had experienced. And I think that to me, the the, the more I look into it, the more, the clearer it sounds that we need to talk about industrial policy. And I think it's a is a something that you it's a bad word depending on the constituency you're talking to. But diversification of the economy, to me, seems something that we should care about. Like Chile is like the, the country that has country cyclical fiscal policy. The whole thing works pretty well, but they are like all copper, and that's it. And, and this is this is this seems to be a problem from the beginning. And I, since people like to say when they when they like the book and when they don't like the book that we are bringing back dependency theory, why not talk about industrial policies as well? But I think it's an issue. Great. Um, this was all. This has all been wonderful so far. We have some time for discussion. I um, have just a couple of comments to make, um, and then we'll start posing some questions. Um, the first is that, and I'm listening to this exchange. I had the same thought that Bob did about why are you limiting this to de to developing countries. Um, this is also true. We see in the United States. Um, and so he said, I'm wondering why you're working so hard to undermine the generalizability of what is a fantastic um, new way of, of thinking about voters. Um, you know, when I think about the articles that have appeared in the American Political Science Review over the last 60 years or so, I don't, I, I will admit I don't remember them all, but I remember a few. And what I'll never forget is Donald Stokes' 1963 article about valence voting. It was so powerful because it was so logical. It was like, why didn't anyone think about this before? I think you're onto something so important when you're talking about this broken link of accountability. We see it today in the news. Oil prices are going up. And so it's Joe Biden's fault. And it's the Democrats are big spenders, even though they haven't spent any money yet. Um, but, but oil, but gasoline prices are going to go up and home heating prices are going to go up this winter and the Democrats are going to take a bath at the polls. Next. So I can agree about the magnitude of the shift, but I think you're saying something so fundamentally important about the way we think about voters and this accountability mechanism and this broken link that this is worth an article in and of itself. Um, I remember, Donnie, I don't know if you'll remember, I gave a talk at Princeton some years ago, and I remember you were shaking your head, scratching your hair, and saying, what are your assumptions about voters? And I thought, I, I haven't thought about this enough. She's absolutely right. You've been thinking about voters for all these years. You've got something very big and important to say, and I wouldn't undersell it. I wouldn't limit it to, um, to countries that are really dependent on the U.S. interest rate or the British interest rate or whatever. I mean, I, I think this is a really fundamentally important argument. Um, and, well, I was going to pass this to Steve to ask some questions first, but I'm sorry, I can't resist. Um, it occurred to me when Bob was talking about tribalism um, that we used to think about insulation from background noise is coming from political parties, or maybe from encompassing social organizations, maybe from labor unions, people trusted alternative sources. Um, if you were to take your analysis back in time, when parties, parties maybe were never quite as strong in um, some Latin American, I mean, they were in some Latin American countries. I mean, you could look at this in Chile, you could look at this in Argentina, perhaps, or um, but if you were to look back in time, at least to when there was some party affiliation or some patterns of partisan voting, would you see the same magnitude of shifts? Or is this a symptom of a time when parties don't control voters anymore? Um, in Latin America. I mean, it could be that I've got the causal arrows backwards and parties don't, people don't, voters don't trust parties anymore because of these kinds of exogenous shocks. But I think there's probably something more going on than that. But, but anyway, that, I'm going to limit myself to that one question. But I think maybe before you answer, we'll collect some more. We've got a few in the chat and there's a few really interesting ones. And I know Steve has got some questions. So I'm going to call on Steve to put forward some questions for you for you know the next few minutes, and then you guys can have the last word in the last five minutes or so. 
Okay, friend. Well, you took my leading questions about parties and partisan, the, the degree to which partisan identities mediate these outcomes. So no problem on that front. Let me just relay a couple of questions from the Q&A. Uh, first of all, Santiago Andrea asks, uh, what, what the, the lessons are um, about how to think about or how to, 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 to carry out redistributive social policies in a context of high volatility, particularly during the good times, during the, 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 the pink tide of the early 21st century, um, a number of scholars and policy advisors, including the questioner's uh, dissertation advisor, I think, uh, advocated for, for small steps, for uh, sort of Chilean style, uh, small incremental steps towards building a welfare state. Um, turns out, at least in the, in the Chilean case, that that, that that sort of ended up with a lot of public frustration when things um, turned downward. So are there any lessons that can be drawn about how to, how to undertake social policy or redistributive reform in the good times um, from, from your work? Um, second question comes from Francisco Modaldi, uh, also a terrific question. He points out that commodity prices are rising again now. Um, the impact is, is a little distorted, certainly quite a bit distorted by the COVID shocks but that seems to be receding. So um, what should we re expect in the, this is, this is the political science, political scientist's favorite job is predicting the future. What should we expect uh, for the future? Do, should we expect the anti-incumbent wave of the last few years to um, recede? And let me, if I could just quickly, I guess, ask a couple of questions about, to, to ask you to, to maybe say a few more words about the consequences of your research for democracy, um, you pointed out, Danny, that that uh, that get the good economic times um, bring fewer irregular transitions, um, which we broadly think of as a good thing. And I think in the most established democracies in Latin America, that's right. So probably there is a positive relationship between um, good economic times and good democratic times in countries like Brazil and Argentina, that when things go bad, uh, the quality and stability of democracy worsens. But then if you turn to say any countries, weaker democracies, uh, much, much more weakly institutionalized regimes, more patrimonial states, where, you where, where good economic times is more likely to give rise to what Sebastian Masuka calls rentier populism, um, you very often see booms helping to consolidate autocratic power, a degree of autocratic power. And economic crisis has been almost a blessing for political liberalism in that it, it's, it's, it brought uh, the end to autocratic governments. Um, so just uh, wanted to react on that and also just um, ask about electoral accountability. The, the, your, your findings have devastating, devastating implications for democratic accountability. And I wonder, you talk a little bit in the book and in your presentation, Danny, about policy steps, economic policy steps that can be taken to counter these cycles. But what if any sort of political or electoral or steps can be taken to um, strengthen the, the, the link between what politicians do and who gets elected uh, in a context of, of volatility? And, and related to that, has, is there any evidence of learning of electorates or civil societies or political elites learning um, and, and thereby sort of le learning about the connection between international commodity prices and domestic performance such that that sort of closes this accountability gap? I have so, so, so many interesting questions. Let me see if I can address some of them and then Cesar will wrap up uh, with other comments. Let me, let me, okay, so let, let me go from the, the more straightforward. That, there's a commodity boom, uh, there was a, a, a mini boom recently with the recovery of the, of, uh, the prices. And this was a major discussion in Brazil, whether they, if the boom persisted, really, what would be the effect on Bolsonaro? And I think that's a very good illustration of the, the problem that we have in Latin America. If the boom persisted, Bolsonaro could have been, could be reelected. If there was a boom similar to the first years of the 2000s, with all the things that we have been seeing in Brazil, he had a chance of being reelected. 
would like, uh, going back to Francis' point, like Trump without the COVID might have been reelected, right? So this is one, uh, uh, right now, we don't know exactly if the boom was just too short because, it, and this goes back to someone that asked, what's the source of the boom? The source of the boom most of the time is China recently. So the first big boom was China entering international markets and this boom would be China recovering from the COVID period, but now it seems that it got to a, a limit and then the prices got to a, a ceiling, it had the ceiling effect too. So we shouldn't expect a longer boom. But, uh, but there was a weird case of like, you see the gains in terms of trade and you don't see appreciation of the currency. This was very unusual and never happened before. And I think it has to do with all the uncertainties that we have in the world, but we, sh we need more time to understand what's going on uh, right now with this mini boom that we had. The, the issue about parties, Cesar is going to talk more about the parties. I think that one, one of the, the, the issues about parties that I think matters a lot and goes back to the political economy of these uh, structural budgeting and counter-cyclical fiscal policies. If you think about any economic model uh, with rational parties, with rational incumbents, you would say, well, given that you reach a level in which you are guaranteed re-election, what should you do with the re remainder? You should save, right, for the future, because you care about the the next incumbent could be someone from your party, right? So if you have any kind of long-term view of politics, alternation of power, parties should care about saving something for the future. The problem is we don't have this. So I think it's very self-enforcing. We have weak parties and parties that are created just before one election for a politician to run and they're owned by the politician. Think about Rafael Correa. What was he thinking? Would he save for the future for anyone? That he wouldn't do that. So I think that the, the fact that we have, there is a reinforcing effect of weak parties that don't have a long-term horizon, and then the, the incentives for expanding are all uh, huge. And I think that Chile, in that sense, got, got coming out from dictatorship and a big trauma, the story that they tell, and I talked to the, the guy that was a finance minister with uh, Bachelet, the story is they had a long-term view at that time, uh, the, the coalition. And so this force them to think about saving for the future, which is something very uncommon uh, here. So th there is no mediation of the party into forcing income politicians to think about the future. And that's, that's a problem. And, and again, so you, you asked about the policies, uh, how to change this. I, I, I'm very, very serious that I, I really think that only acknowledging that we are commodity exporters and thinking about budgets in that sense, that's the only way. When, when, when we started this book, the, the premise was that it was about information. People in, in Europe, they have information. Uh, and in Latin America, they don't about uh, benchmarking in other countries and all that. Our experiments, what they suggest, and goes back to the effective uh, issues, that it's not about information. You can tell anyone that lived through the crisis with Dilma, that Dilma, that the world was really bad, and that Dilma was the lucky one. Nobody cares. Nobody cares, they don't want to see Dilma anymore. And people that live through the good times of Lula, they have this memory and this, that's very little you can do. So our conclusions that what we can do to break this connection is not to allow this connection to exist. And the only way not to allow the connection to exist, the, bon the external bonanza and people's welfare is not to allow politicians to spend it all and to force them to spend when things are bad. So this is what levels the playing field. The example that I like to give is like Rafael Correa had 14 percentage points over GDP of fiscal revenues more than uh, uh, Lucio Gutierrez. 14 percentage points of the GDP. So a country like Ecuador under Rafael Correa is one with Lucio Gutierrez is another. So people cannot compare. So when you ask a question about like learning, it's really hard because there's no way to compare. The conditions are not fixed. Nothing is fixed. So in that sense, it's really hard, I think, for anyone, and, and again, even for us to, 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 to learn how to, to, to discount these things. I, I think that the, the only solution I foresee is to prevent this effect, the good and the bad effect, from, from happening. Uh, yeah, I think that Cesar, Cesar will, will get with the, from the, the parties and the partisans and anti-partisans how they played this game. <laughs> So uh, to get to Fran's question first, um, the, 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 there was one chapter in the book that we had planned and we didn't write, and that was a comparison of countries with stronger and weaker parties, or stronger, stronger and weaker party identification. We had thought about, you know, let's look at Uruguay and, and Ecuador, and try to do a comparison between the two, and kind of small. And it, so, so our, our intuition is that, yeah, you know, there's this general process, and perhaps if we have a large, larger share of partisans, possibly the, the political swings that follow uh, uh, the shocks are smaller, but, it, but it's actually an empirical question, right? Because 
even if you have a such as the US, say a 30-30 split, uh, if the swing voters are swinging with the with the economy, you'd still possibly uh, uh, see if if maybe less variation in vote in in, in, uh, in popularity, you'd still probably see a uh, variation in in re-election simply because it's possible that you don't need everybody to be swinging uh, to uh, to have the results. So it would actually be an empirical question, and. It goes back to the point that uh, elections get rarer in Latin America if you go back to the past, right? So uh, it would have to be probably something more uh, qualitatively or, or, or look more into each of the cases in more detail to arrive at the conclusion. So, yes, we have the intuition that uh, partisanship would matter, but there are reasons to think that it, even if it matters, it might not change the gist of the argument. Uh, but we weren't, we, that was a, a chapter that, you know, as we progressed, we ended up going other directions. And that, that was one that was, was still on the shelf. But you know, it's one of the things that we we, we have the drawing board to look at. Um, lessons for social policy. I, I would say the main lesson from the, the from a boom period, to keep in mind from our book, is that there will be a bust period, and I think uh, um, and then afterwards there will be another boom of some kind, right? So hopefully. <laughs> so uh, so so the book's about volatility. So I think the lesson to uh, to take for, for social policy, and I think that's something that Brazil was starting to discuss uh, with uh, as we realized that Bolsa Familia was not suited. For instance, uh, as a good answer for uh, for COVID, is to think of uh, build into social policy uh, this adjusting mechanism, right? To know that you you will have probably a certain percent share of the population needs to be covered by a safety net uh, uh, permanently, but there, this will rise and fall in good times and bad times, and you need to account for you need to anticipate that there will be good times and bad times. I think that's an element of the design that makes it actually a safety net uh, that makes it more counter cyclical too. But that, which we never had the, the I think we don't we haven't thought we hadn't thought about this yet because a lot of this social assistance came into existence in Latin America during the seemingly unendable super cycle of commodities and uh, I don't think that was a uh, high on the agenda at that point but I think that's a good lesson to take back. Uh, just touch very quickly um, on uh, the, the Steve's questions. Uh, Steve, so our uh, uh, um, we actually. I'm actually thinking and working, and we are working on, the, on, on a possible link between this volatility and institutional weakness in the long run. So you're right that we have regular transitions, but we, uh, we are looking at both uh, autocrats and Democrats, right? So uh, the coding of what's a regular tradition and autocracy is a little bit harder, but in the case of Brazil is pretty far. There was that year, a date in which the power was going to be handled, handled over by one military guy to another, and there was a process, and many, Many times there are some kind of process, there is some kind of process, and, and then you get deviations from that process that we're calling irregular. So the regular, the regular is not always good. The regular is a continuity. It's, it, it's a very blunt measure of success of the incumbent that we uh, created to be able to extend our analysis back to the 60s and uh, cover periods that didn't have elections. So what, where, where am I getting to? So we, that argument talks about removal, right? Removal from office. And, and, and we do see that there's more removal when condition, exogenous conditions are bad. What we're trying to think about looking at, and this is something following uh, uh, Ernesto Cao with Vicky in, in the book about uh, 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 institutional weakness very, very recently, there's a, one chapter in there that's kind of along the lines we are, we're thinking about working, is that we, we suspect that in good times, even though there's less removal from office, there's more attempts by the incumbents to change rules and to consolidate power and to stay longer. Right? So if that is a uh, regularity, and it's an if, right? we haven't tested, we don't have the data yet, we're still working on it, you would have a logical argument for, for having institutional weakness on the upturn, on the high swings, where incumbents attempt to stay forever because they're doing well, and to have some kind of institutional weakness um, in, in bad times, a source of institutional weakness in bad times, when uh, opposition or social forces remove Governments from power, irrespective of their of their quality, right? They might be good, might be a good removal, a bad removal, but it is a removal. So in that sense, the volatility could be leading to the erosion or the or or or, 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 or at least the non-consolidation of institutions, uh, uh, both on the upturns and the downturns. And if you consider that Latin America has always been kind of commodity dependent, and that's kind of the historical pro program that I'm interested in going uh, after, this might actually be. A source of persistent institutional weakness, which is if you're plugged into the world economy as a commodity producer from the start, you're going to have huge swings. If you had huge swings, huge swings count against having rules. It, it, it counts towards towards we need to change the rules. We need to change the rules. We need to change the rules. Right? So we'll, either because it's too good or too bad. And uh, and I think that's kind of where 
I see this work going to. I don't know if this will hold uh, 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 in the face of, the, of, of empirical evidence, but you know, the, it is an idea. Uh, in and this kind of gets to Anthony Calcino's question here, too, right? Uh, I, I, and now, in my, in my sense, my get my answer to Anthony's uh, here in the Q and A would be: institutions are endogenous to these links, to these swings. <laughs> it's not that they cause these swings; they might actually reinforce it. But in the first place, there is a swing. The swing comes before any institution. That's that's a legit point. Now, I have actually, yeah. Now I was going to add something, but the. I don't know. I think that one we're asking about social policy is not specifically about social policy, but I think that looking back to what happened during the commodity boom, it seems to me that the left in Latin America always it, it's capable of being left when there is something, some uh, accident, let's put it this way. So when there's more than expected, then there's some level of redistribution. I, I'm not sure, looking back to the experience of the, the commodity boom, whether there is a left in Latin America that knows how to be left without the boom. So where do we take the money from? How do we face the fact that we have to extract from the wealthiest and there's no way to reduce inequality without taking from some to give to the others? And I think there is no, I, I don't see uh, one example that would say, well, that's what, how a country figured how to be, uh, to redistribute and to have a left-wing government that distributes income without the boom uh, altogether. And I think that now, maybe in the last campaign when, when the PT lost from, uh, from uh, Bolsonaro, Haddad was starting to talk about which kind of policy we would have, the redistributive policy that would not rely on having the accident of the boom. But I don't think we have an answer now, and I and and, and I think that's an open question for the for the next one. What a wonderful discussion! I hate to close, but we really are out of time, and so I need to do that. Um, I want to thank from the bottom of my heart all of our panelists. Who I'm always so happy to see you've given us such a wonderful book and such a wonderful discussion. So thank you so much. And I hope that everyone joins us next Tuesday for our panel. We're looking at the impact of Venezuelan migration in the region. And so we have people talking about the Amazon and Brazil, about Colombia, Ecuador. So I really hope that um, we have a great turnout next week for what promises to be a really interesting panel. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, have a wonderful rest Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for all. See you.